So end of 2016, I started working online at $10 an hour doing all sorts of random miscellaneous admin-ish tasks. In 2020, I brought in over 100K as a freelance digital business manager. That is a big jump. So in today's video, let's talk about the seven things that I did to scale from $10 an hour to hitting that coveted 8.33333 mark per month. Hi, my name is Dea, freelancer, digital business manager, and most recently, entrepreneur and as always you will find timeline sections below so click through to what you're most interested in because i know your time is precious so let's dive straight into the video and let's talk about the seven things that i did that made this scaling of income possible the first thing is on the topic of niching now niching is kind of a weird subject because i feel like a lot of people have a lot of opinions about niching some people are like niche 100 percent like niche right away niche into the smallest niche you can find because the riches are in the niches okay they pronounce it that way which is why it rhymes i don't pronounce it that way which is why it does not rhyme um and some people say don't niche start broad go broad and just stay broad because then you can kind of cast a wider net my personal advice and based on my experience, the best thing to do is if you're just getting started with no experience and you have no clue what you like, obviously if you know what you like and you already have experience, like go and explore those niches for sure. But if you're just getting started and you have no experience, no clue what you like, then my biggest advice is in the first six to 12 months, try everything. Try everything, don't be picky, don't limit yourself, try everything because then quickly you'll find out what you like and more importantly, what you don't like. And then slowly you can begin niching and then once you have a little bit more clarity on what you actually like then begin niching in phases so what i mean is don't just go from broad as in i'm i'm serving absolutely everybody to i'm only serving this one tiny subject of human beings but niche in phases where you slowly come down because then you can be sure that you are niching in small steps instead of in one drastic step and then start to filter based on your personal priorities so what are your priorities in the work that you do and the clients that you work with is it how easy the tasks are how passionate you feel how profitable they are, what the clients do, maybe the purpose of what the client is building in terms of their businesses. Make a list of that, figure out which ones you wanna prioritize and then begin ranking your clients. And then you can start to really notice a pattern of the niche that you should probably be going into because yeah, their work really lights you up and it doesn't leave you feeling drained at the end of the workday. I always say this because if you don't know what you're doing, don't niche too fast. If you niche too fast, you might box yourself out of other jobs or other skill sets that you might actually really like once you give them a fair try. But niching eventually is very important for three reasons. One, it makes it much easier to remember what it is that you do and for other people to remember what you do so that they can refer you. Like if you are the XYZ person, like if you are the Dubsado expert, you know, that's something very easy to remember and refer to other people when they're talking about Dubsado. It's like, oh, I know a great Dubsado person. Two, when you start to niche, you start to invest your energy and time into one specific space instead of spreading yourself too thin. So you'll slowly become better and better at it because you are, yeah, like focused. And I can't understate the importance of focus when you are growing your own business. And three, the third best thing about niching is clarity and simplicity always wins at the end of the day. Confused people do not pull out their wallets and purchase anything. So if you have 16 different services on your website, people are gonna come, look at it, be confused about what it is exactly that you do, and they'll probably X out if there are too many options and too much confusing or overlapping services that don't really have a clear, oh, you are the expert in XYZ space. So that is why I always recommend start broad and then slowly niche in phases so that's the first thing that i definitely did is i went from admin so doing everything i tried everything if you want a video on that i'm linking that here i really did try everything and then slowly i moved into content management and then moved into project management and then i found business management and i was like this is the niche that I live for. This is the niche that is so fun, but I would have never found that if I hadn't given myself like ample time to try everything first and then slowly niche and phase this to be sure that that was the direction I wanted to actually go in. Two, invest in your biggest asset. Can you guess what your biggest asset is? Yep, it is. It's you, <laughs> lol. <laughs> Investing in myself was probably the best thing I could have done for my long-term profitability and sustainability, but also for my personal interest and passion for my work, which like passion for your work is a really solid foundation for ensuring that this is the line of work that you wanna do for a long period of time and not just kind of as a few months thing, right? 
and every step of the way I invested in one way or another and if you're thinking day I don't have any money I can't invest in anything that's fine you can invest your time that's what I did when I first started I didn't have much money to invest so I just invested a lot of time in learning and growing catching myself up to be sure that I was providing the best value to my clients so the two things you can do you can invest time so take internships learn from the right people do free classes there's so much stuff on the internet now read articles blog posts listen to podcasts by experts you can build your network for free talk to people hang out with them in different free membership groups and that's one way of investing your time now if you want to invest money if you start to like earn a little bit of money and you want to put that money to good use then you can invest in hiring a mentor or coach buying a course that will train you in a skill set that will allow you to increase your rates you can buy templates or resources that can help you do your job faster you can join a coaching program you can join paid networking you can get tools training so there are lots of different ways depending on where you currently are if you don't have money then invest time if you don't have time then invest money and the combination of those two is actually why I think I was able to scale so quickly because I was developing myself and my skill set to be the most valuable skill set that I could think of and how to best support my clients. And if you always have that in the back of your head is like, how can I best support my clients? How can I best serve them? Chances are they're going to notice that you're going to become better and better at your job and slowly you'll see your income take off and they'll refer you to everybody and then you'll have more clients and the happy cycle continues. <laughs> Third thing is understanding client psychology and their way of thinking and what's going on in the background of the client experience. Understanding what clients truly cared about and how to read between the lines. Whenever I was talking with a client helped me so much because I could get to the root of what they were secretly afraid of or secretly thinking of or secretly wanted for themselves much faster and thus I could address those things instead of kind of the more surface level things if that makes sense. So here's what clients care about. One, what is the end result of this project? What do I ideally want to achieve? What's the point of this hire? So to answer this question in your head, you need to know what they ultimately want. If somebody's hiring you to handle their social media, they don't care about posts going out on their social media. They care about what that social media is going to do for their business. So if you talk about that specific thing and instead of how many posts you're gonna post or what kind of stories you're gonna share. You can address that ideal state that they wanna to get to even faster. Two, they're thinking, can this person actually do this job? Is there proof that they're the right person? Are they the best person on this job? So gather proof, gather testimonials, gather portfolio items, gather the relevant things to show off the exact skill set that you are being hired for to be like, look, I am the best. Here is social proof from other human beings who have said that they've done exactly this service with me and they loved it. Three, how much is it? Is it worth the result that I want? So making sure you are crystal clear in your pricing and that you always tie that pricing to the value of the service that you are providing and the result that they're going to get. What are they going to get out of you providing the service to them? Tie that monetarily to how much they're investing. Show them the return on investment, the ROI of the service. Four, when can they have it done by? So this is more like timeline stuff. Be clear about what's going to happen when they pay you money. Be crystal clear, give them transparency into your process when they can expect certain things from you. This is really important because one, it manages expectations so that later there aren't a million misunderstandings and everything is chaos and the client's like, I thought this was gonna be done by then. You were like, no, I clearly told you X, Y, Z. So be crystal clear upfront about what they can expect in the process. And two, I find that sometimes clients, when they are micromanaging you or when they are trying to control you, it's because they don't have transparency into what they can expect when. And when you do give them that transparency, they're a lot less like panicky about what's going on. Like, are you working on what we said you were? Or like, so build in milestones if you have a really big project so that they can be clear where you currently are and what phase the project is currently in. So those are the main four questions clients are thinking about. And alongside that, I would just say, always try to make it as simple and as easy of a process for the end client. Sometimes I've also hired people that have really made me jump through a lot of hoops and that exhaustion of like, I haven't even hired this person yet, but they're already making things so much harder for me is sometimes a bit concerning for a business owner to be like, well, they're not making my life easier or they're not thinking of me and making and how to make my life easier yet. And I haven't even started working with them. Like, are they gonna know how to make my life easier once we actually start working together? So always in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how can I make this process as seamless as possible? What can I take off their plate? What can I do on my side so that they don't even have to think about it or worry about it? 
And at the end of the day, if you address their key concerns, you know, and you focus on them, where they want to go, what problems or pain points they currently have, you know, don't talk too much about yourself. Don't talk too much about the features of what your service does. Don't talk too much about like the granular details of everything. They just really care. Can this person do this? And are they the right person? So make sure you focus on that. And here is a bonus 3A tip. <laughs> Always under promise and over deliver. I, this is another thing that I really, okay, I'm, uh, here's the secret. I'm a huge people pleaser. So I was really afraid of letting people down. So I always under promised and over delivered. And I think that's actually a huge reason why I was referred out so much is because clients always left the experience feeling like, whoa, like Dea really like delivered what she said she would and then some. So that's another great tip is don't do the bare minimum. You can over deliver on time, right? Deliver something earlier than you said you would and what I do is normally I just like add a little bit of extra buffer into the timeline and then when I finish on time they think it's early you can deliver on quality you can deliver something that is more or better than what originally you agreed upon or you can deliver on quantity you can give them a little bit more like if they wanted I don't know a 500 word article you can write them a 750 word article that is guaranteed to leave a client feeling like wow they really went above and beyond like this is a great contractor or freelancer if you do an outstanding job, you will make it much easier to refer you. Honestly, good talent is really hard to find, so make it easy to refer you. Tip four, start low and slowly scale your income. Don't just hyper focus on making tons of money from day one. That is definitely something that helped me a lot. Like I've talked about a lot. I started low because I was essentially, my mindset was they are paying me to learn. And this is the best thing ever because me learning is an investment again in the biggest asset in a freelance business who is me. So the faster I learn, the faster I can charge more money and the longer I can sustain myself and keep things really, really profitable. So that's why I wanted to invest in learning. And so I essentially made my rates a little cheaper in the beginning so that clients could work with me and I could book more jobs so that I could absorb as much as I could. I find that oftentimes people over focus on money, which of course I understand because you need money to pay your bills. I needed money to pay my bills as well, but I'm talking about the big picture. There is a way to make money and still keep things very strategic and slowly scale your pricing so that you're always learning and continuously yeah ensuring that clients still want to work with you and that you aren't pricing out the right clients so one way to be strategic with your pricing is to give a little leeway to strategic clients so one example of strategic clients is when i first started freelancing i started really low and sometimes i would lower my rate to get my foot in the door with the right client who i know through my own research and sleuthing that they had a huge network of incredible business owners that were my target people. So that's one way to get in with a client that might open up a whole world of possibilities for you. One of my clients did this for me and referred me so many clients through her mastermind just because I was already working with her and she knew me and she wanted to refer me out because I was doing a good job. So don't discount strategic clients. Invest in building relationships with the right people. Join strategic paid memberships that have your target people it is an investment in your business and it will pay off in the long run. Another thing to keep in mind when sometimes I definitely also over focused on money when I first got started and I signed a client who was paying me extremely well but was a major red flag client. Do not discount your passion, your energy, and your mental health most importantly when you are working online with clients. There are some things that are just not worth any amount of money. And I hope I don't have to say this, but no amount of money is worth your mental health, your mental sanity, your mental energy, and your peace in your life. And it is also not sustainable at all to keep signing on red flag clients, even if they pay you tons and tons of money, that's just no fun. So do not discount how much you personally want to work with somebody when you are starting freelancing and making sure that you're actually signing clients that you're really excited about and that you feel like warm and joy when you talk to them. If you take on clients that constantly drain you, you are draining your biggest asset, which is you. You are draining your mental energy and your health and that is just not a good way to go. So make sure you are factoring in that component as well when you are potentially signing on clients. So in terms of pricing scaling, what I did was I reevaluated my rates every six to 12 months with clients in the beginning it was every six months because I was way under charging like the market industry average so I just reevaluated every six months and then after a while I started reevaluating every 12 months and that's how I scaled my income quite quickly and the awesome thing about freelancing is you have many eggs and many baskets so you can kind of like reevaluate your rate with one client at a time to buffer some of that risk 
um, instead of if you only have one job and you're trying to like negotiate a salary increase there. With multiple clients, you have more leverage and so you can feel a little bit safer in trying to renegotiate your rate. Number five, accept that it is about numbers and just get out there. Sometimes people get so stuck on like rejections or people saying no to them that they just quit and they never start. They're like, oh, I asked one person or I asked two people and they both said no to me, so I just don't wanna do it ever again. You know, you have to accept that it's a math equation at the end of the day. You know, you have to get this X many people into your door and through every step of your client step-by-step -step system. You know, do they book a free call with you? Do you get on the call? Do you like, what are your steps? And every step of the way you have to convert the rate at which you are converting people into the next step and then ultimately calculate out your full final client conversion rate and then just keep bringing people through and know that you're not going to be able to convince every single person you talk to to work with you and that is normal nobody has a 100 percent conversion rate so cast the wide net and do not discount the fact that even if you're getting rejected even if you're getting no's you know what you're learning and you're getting practice you're getting practice at getting good at interviews you're getting good at explaining what it is that you do you're getting good at conveying and understanding what exactly they're thinking and what the client is processing in their head as they're talking to you and honestly i got a lot of rejections when i first got started as well it's heartbreaking i know but i truly believe all of that practice prepared me to be the best freelancer i could be and eventually my conversion rates started getting better and better as i got more comfortable on interviews and everything and yeah that like the rest is history though that's why i think i was able to be booked out so quickly Fred says hi Six, so this is kind of a fluffy sounding tip, but work on your mindset. We all need to work on our mindset. Like there's so much weird stuff that happens up there that truly keeps us holding back from creating or potentially laying the steps for building our dream life, whatever that may look like to you. Working on my mindset is the number one most profit generating task I do in my business. Your mind is gonna tell you so many stories of why you can't do something and why it's not right for you or why now is not the right time and all this stuff. You need to understand where that's coming from and how to go past that and how to understand with compassion what your mind is trying to tell you. Like obviously it's trying to protect you, but sometimes that's not the most useful thing that you need when you are embarking on something that's out of your comfort zone and potentially could create a life that is really exciting and amazing for you. So journal, get comfortable get aware with what like thought process are triggering things in your head you know are you somebody who is a perfectionist are you feeling imposter syndrome are you afraid of failure are you afraid of rejection where does that all come from like really have a think about that and really walk yourself through like are these rational fears you know is this something that i'm willing to listen to if it prevents me from going down a path that i feel in my gut is the right thing to explore or eventually down on seven find your people find your people like your people are gonna keep you going in your darkest days so for me personally I think sometimes like the people are the ones that have pulled me out of holes and just like made sure that I got the encouragement and the words of encouragement that I needed to actually keep going when I felt like I don't know, like when I felt like maybe this path wasn't right for me. So there are lots of free options. You can go join Facebook groups. You can hang out with people, look up people on Instagram, on LinkedIn, you know, join those groups. I connected with a lot of people on Instagram and LinkedIn. I went to co-working spaces. I went to cafes. I even sometimes went to networking events, even though I'm not a huge fan of networking. Um, I also have a 100% free Facebook group. If you wanna join us in there, it's called the A-Team and I'll put a link in the description box below. There are a lot of fellow aspiring work from anywhere in that group. And paid options, I went to retreats with other digital nomads, people who wanted to work online and travel as well. That was super fun. Um, I also joined masterminds. I also joined paid groups and communities and memberships. I went to paid events as well, like conferences. So those are also other options to connect and find awesome people. And actually at one of the retreats that I was at, I met one of my best business friends ever. Her name is Georgie and we have weekly calls and we've had them since the retreat and it's been amazing. Like that friendship, like that one friendship, obviously priceless, but I'm so 
glad that I went on the retreat because I never would have met her otherwise. So like you don't even discount like just having one or two really, really great people that you can really count on, that you can really like get vulnerable about your struggles with and hear them be like, I, I get you, like I'm there with you. So find somebody like that or find an accountability buddy in one of the groups that I mentioned as well. And here's a bonus eighth tip. All right, you ready for it? Just do it. I find so many people when they are trying to scale, when they're trying to get started, when they're trying to take steps is they create all these fake hurdles for themselves that they have to accomplish. They're like, when I have a website, then I can increase my rates. When I have a Facebook page, when I have an Instagram profile, when I start like posting content on Instagram, that's when I can begin scaling. That's when I can begin growing. That's when I can keep going. And like, that's a sign, a magical sign that I can keep going. All of that is just stuff your brain is making up and telling you to try to protect you from leaving your comfort zone. None of those things are true. Those are not tasks that move the needle. All right. I know how tempting it is to wait until you feel ready, until everything is perfect to begin to scale, to take the next steps that you know in your heart are the next steps for you if you do wanna scale. Don't listen to those voices. What gets things moving is just getting out there, talking to people, applying to jobs, pitching yourself. Those are things that actually move the needle. Those are the things that you should be focusing on if you want to scale. So yeah, those are the seven plus one more bonus eight things that I did that I think truly are the reason why I was able to scale from $10 an hour to six figures in four, has it been four or five years now? So I hope you give these tips a try. If you do, let me know which one you do. Let me know which tips are working for you as you are scaling. And I'd love to chat with you in the comment box below and I'll catch you in the next video. All right, bye.